This is the Mazda 6. And this is Mazda's answer to quite a lot of things, actually. Traditionally, it would be Mazda's contender against the Toyota Camry and the Honda Accord, fellow mass market D segment saloons. But the way Mazda positions this car, they also think that it should be considered a premium alternative, which means that it rivals cars like the Volkswagen Passat and Volkswagen Arteon, as well as actual premium contenders like the BMW 3 Series and Mercedes Benz C Class. Compared to its premium segment brethren, it's certainly bigger. Compared to its mass market brethren, it's about the correct size. But more importantly, the question is, does this car have what it takes to not only hold its own in the D-segment mass market space, but actually not embarrass itself against premium cars? In this review, we're going to find out. My name is Ayman Ay Abdullah, and this is Malaysian Motoring. So this is the 2020 model year Mazda 6 and uh, for 2020 there are some small aesthetic upgrades that we're going to take a look at as we do this quick walk around. So for starters you can see that the chrome around the grille is now um, a lot more prominent, it's a lot thicker as well. Uh, you get some new LED headlights with uh, a new LED headlight signature as you can see. Uh, you no longer get fog lights, instead you have this chrome strip that goes uh, down the bottom and you have this new sort of thatched design to the grille and uh, overall it certainly looks very imposing it looks very elegant I think um, and it certainly does a lot to help keep the Mazda 6 up to date the thing is a lot of us tend not to realize that the Mazda 6 is one of the older contenders in the segment since this car came out uh, let's see the Honda Accord has a new generation the Toyota Camry has a new generation um, the Nissan Tiana's died a, an, an awful death um, so this is actually one of the older cars in the D segment, um, but thanks to all of those little aesthetic upgrades, the car certainly looks very, very fresh still, especially in this beautiful sole red metallic. Um, it's also helped by these relatively large alloy wheels, which are 19 inches in diameter, which are absolutely massive uh, for a car in this segment, but uh, mercifully it seems to not impact the ride that much. Uh, this car runs on Bridgestone Taranza tyres, if I'm not mistaken, I, if I can find a brand. Yes, it's a Taranza T005A. So. These tyres are surprisingly good, they're very um, very grippy, they're relatively quiet, they're good tyres actually for this car. Uh, and like I said, despite the fact that this runs on relatively large alloy wheels, it doesn't seem to impact the ride, but we'll talk more about that uh, in the driving segment. Now in the back you get a new set of tail lights with the chrome strip that extends uh, even further than before. You now get LED indicators and an LED uh, tail light. You still get uh, a pair of real exhaust, which is always nice. Um, they sound okay, la, uh, but what are you really expecting from a four-cylinder anyway? So this is the top spec 2.5 litre, so we've got a two and a half litre engine up front, uh, and of course you can have, you'll see the badging about there. So since we're here, let's take a look at the trunk, or the boot. And uh, as you can see, the boot in this car is rather generous. There's plenty of space in here for most of your stuff, plenty of space for luggage and stuff like that. For a family of five, a weekend away, definitely more than enough space. In fact, you could probably go, go away for a whole week. And uh, of course, if you happen to do a little bit of furniture shopping, you can lower the seats via those little pull tabs. This uh, tailgate, however, is not power operated. It is fully manual. Um, you have a little button release back here and you have another button release inside the car and of course one on the key but um, it's not powered and weirdly it's also not uh, spring-loaded either. So a lot of cars um, like the Hyundai Elantra for example which is a segment lower, um, if you were to open the boot it would just pop open like that whereas this one just sort of sits there uh, which is a bit weird. I would have preferred if the boot popped open um, but 
talking about the exterior, you can tell that this car, even though it is a little bit older, it certainly doesn't look it. This is still very much a stunning looking machine. Uh, in fact, when I picked it up today, I took a long, hard look at it and I realized that, damn, this is still one of the best looking D-segment saloons out there. There aren't that many uh, available now, unfortunately, but uh, admittedly, this is a very, very good looking contender. Now, let's take a quick look at the interior while we're here. Oop. Yeah, actually, that's another thing I want to mention. The keyless entry in this car, it's not the sensor type because I'm very used to just putting my hand here and then opening the door. But uh, you have to press the button. Then it unlocks. Bit annoying. Now it's going to beep and bong at me for leaving the lights on. Okay, so this is what the interior of the Mazda 6 looks like. So you've got uh, leather seats, a leather upholstery throughout, even on the door cards and even on the dash. Um, you get a powered driver's seat with lumbar support and two-stage memory, whereas the passenger seat is only four-way adjustable electric. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, six-way adjustable electric uh, and no memory. But uh, as I said, in this car, you do get leather upholstery, which is nice. And you even get the leather, the leather extends down onto the door cards as well, where you get stitching here, you get stitching here, and you get this thing. I really don't know what this is. It feels almost, it, it looks like it's meant to mimic wood, but it's not really wood. I've never seen wood come in silver, but yeah, it, whatever. So there's metal trim here, which looks good, and it extends all the way into the door, the door handle. This is plastic, but it feels really, really high quality. But the metal, the real metal continues in here. So you've got more metal here, got more metal around there, and it feels really, really high quality. So I'll just step inside to show you. So this interior to me is just a display of really smart use of materials. So where it matters, Mazda has really used high quality stuff. So for example, the uh, steering wheel itself is leather wrapped. Uh, the dash front here, this is leather with stitching. Up here, you've got soft touch material, which is always nice. You even got more stitching and more leather just sort of around here. This is an area that you'll never touch, but it feels really, really high quality. And uh, when you go down into the center stack, you can see that, okay, you've got your climate controls here, but you can see that even here, they've used soft leather. I'm not sure if this is coming across on camera, but it's really squishy here, which is nice because your knees will usually bash into this. So it's nice that it's hitting a soft material. You get a lot of piano black around here, um, which uh, some people like piano black, some people don't. Um, I don't mind it if it's executed well enough, but unfortunately here it's just, it's the type that leaves a lot of marks and stuff. I mean, this car was just washed and you can already see sort of water marks because it wasn't dried properly. Um, and, and that's you know, a little bit of a concern. If you're a neat freak like me, you will not appreciate this sort of thing. Uh, down into the center console, you've got a couple of cup holders here with little tabs to help keep your drinks in place and a little roller shutter if you don't want to see it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that. You also have an airbag up here. It says SRS airbag there. But more importantly, this is your glove compartment, which is... Oh, excuse the holder but uh, this is the glove compartment in the Mazda 6 and it's relatively small and it's mostly taken up by the owner's manual and service booklet and uh, to be honest I'm not a fan of whenever service booklets take up all the space like this I feel like this ought to be integrated somewhere a bit neater maybe somewhere in the boot perhaps um, but anyway let's uh, take a look at what we've got here so going back to the steering wheel you have your cruise control settings here your infotainment system here this info button actually controls the uh, multi-info display up there which i'll show you in a second uh, and up here you have a pair of analog gauges as well as a digital uh, screen here let me just switch the car on so i can show you okay so as you can see this is the digital cluster here. Um, excuse the terrible, terrible mileage. I just picked the car up and we've been doing quite a lot of filming, so obviously it's going to look a bit crap. Uh, but by the end of this review, I'll have a better figure to show you. Um, but you can cycle through various different uh, information items here. So trip A, trip B, service due. This is your uh, advanced driver assist features uh, like blind spot monitoring and um, uh, A, B and stuff like that. This car doesn't come with adaptive cruise control, unfortunately. Um, but if it did, you would see that there. Let me just lower the fan speed so it doesn't bother the camera uh, you also have your range and then you go back to your trip and that's pretty simple um, all of your warning uh, signs are mostly here uh, your indicators are sort of no that's the wrong thing so your indicators are just sort of right up there in the corner now here 
this is the MZD Connect system, uh, which is Mazda's infotainment, their proprietary infotainment system. And uh, to be honest, it is, it's pretty good. For what it's worth, it's pretty good. Compared to the other mass market uh, vehicles, this is definitely one of the better systems out there. Um, I think the only one that does this better is Hyundai because uh, Hyundai's systems are just so straightforward. It's really nice. But this integrates both a touchscreen, as you can see here. Yeah, so this is a touchscreen and you also get a knob. There, a knob. And so this knob makes it a lot easier to use the system when you're driving. Uh, whereas the system from Hyundai is purely touch, uh, which can be a little bit of a hindrance when you're driving along. Um, so yeah, this system is touchscreen, like I mentioned earlier, but it's only touch when the car is in park and the handbrake is up. If you are driving, this stops working. So it requires you to use the knob. Uh, it also comes with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard. But unfortunately, the size of the screen is relatively small. Um, I think we've just gotten really spoiled with big screens. And it works well. It displays everything really well. The resolution could be better. But as far as I'm concerned, if it has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, I won't complain quite as much. Um, but it's a, it's a good system. Overall, it's definitely a good system. I definitely have this over some of the um, OEM or those, those built pseudo built-in uh, infotainment systems. I really, really like this. <clears throat> Another thing I like about MZD Connect is that it doesn't integrate the climate control crap in here. So instead, it's all down here. So you still have a knob to adjust your temperature. You've still got buttons to adjust your fan speed. This is really nice. I love that this is separate and more car makers ought to leave it separate like this because it's so much easier to adjust your climate control settings when they are separate. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a rant. Um, Electrochromatic rear view mirror, so it doesn't blind you. This is your sunglasses holder, all that standard nonsense. Uh, here you have your lights, which are halogen, unfortunately. Uh, and you also get a sunroof in the top spec model, which is nice. I always like sunroofs. Uh, some Malaysians don't. Uh, I don't understand what the f your problem is, because if you're hot, just... Like, is that so bloody hard? But, you know, whatever. Anyway, let's go step into the back and see what life is like back there. Yep, sure enough, that's my crap. Okay, so let me just push all this stuff over there and the car is beeping because it senses that the key is outside the vehicle. All right, so now that we're in the back of the Mazda 6, now you can really see just how big this car is. So like I said, it is a D-segment saloon, so there's plenty of space. This seat is set up in my driving position. I am 160 something odd centimeters. Uh, and this is set up my driving position. So sitting back here, I have plenty of knee room and I've got plenty of foot room and I can tuck my feet in underneath the seat so even if there was a taller driver in front of me I can still sit quite comfortably. I do get a couple of air vents back here which is nice. Um, there's no climate control and these are not blowers I think. Maybe there is, I'm not sure. Um, but it's relatively strong. It will keep the rear half of the cabin quite cool. Uh, looking around here you can see that metal trim that I showed you on the front door cards as well as this not wood. Uh, it's still here so it's all consistent and all the quality remains consistent throughout the vehicle. So now you can see that I have a decent amount of headroom uh, and I've got pretty good shoulder support if I'm honest. There's plenty of sort of bolster support to keep me in place which I quite like. Um, and also the seat bases are actually relatively long. Um, they stop just short of under my knees, but I think that most people could be quite comfortable back here. And you can slouch like this, like an idiot, and you'll still be quite comfortable. Uh, you have Isofix mounts back here, obviously, because most cars have Isofix mounts back here these days. Uh, so you can fit a couple of child seats. And you also get, so in the center armrest, you pull this down, and you have a couple of cup holders, and then there's this slot. And I'm sure you're wondering, what does this slot do? So this is actually where you can stick your phone because you can charge it via the USBs. There's two USBs here. So you can charge your devices while putting them here or you can put them in the cup holder, for example. And there's two of them. So if you have two kids back here, they can each charge their own devices and stay happy throughout the trip and not argue with each other. That is really, really nice. Unfortunately, because it's here, it means that you can only use the USBs when you have the armrest down. So if you have five passengers in the car, there's no USB there. So if there's five passengers in the car, sorry la, you're not charging anything. That is a little bit of a shame. Um, and what else do we have back here? We've still got some city lights and that's it. 
that's all we've got. So if I just step back out of the car, let me just reach over there and actually, no, let's take a second look at this. This cabin is really, really pretty. It's not flash. It's not sort of jaw droppingly pretty. It just looks nice and it feels premium. Um, all the materials in here are very considered. They're very, very carefully constructed and selected. And as a result, this car really feels like a class above. It feels really good in here to sit in here, to drive, to interact with all the buttons. The tactility is awesome. And uh, the ergonomics in here are great too. So what is the Mazda 6? So as I said uh, in the intro, this is a D-segment mass market saloon, but it has aspirations to be a left a field choice for those who may have been otherwise looking at a premium compact saloon. So the one that we've got here is a 2.5 litre saloon, uh, which is middle of the range. There is actually a 2.2 litre turbo diesel that sits above this, as well as a, uh, a touring version, which is very, very pretty. But uh, this is in the middle of the pack. So under the bonnet, you have a 2.5 litre Sky Active G engine, which puts out 192 horsepower and a at 258 newton meters of torque with power going to the front wheels via a six-speed automatic gearbox uh, fuel consumption in this car is rated at seven liters per hundred kilometers or whatever the hell that is uh, but in the time that we've had it this car has consistently returned just above 13 kilometers per liter yes i'm aware those are two different metrics unfortunately i cannot get the car to tell me anything other than kilometers per liter um, so aside from that, this car also gets G Vectoring Control Plus, which is Mazda speak for lots of little things happening in the background to ensure that your drive is smooth and steady. And uh, you also get quite a lot in terms of active safety. As that bike blows past, that reminds me that this car has blind spot monitoring. It's got lane keep assist with lane centering. Uh, it has autonomous emergency braking. It has rear cross traffic alert. It's also got a 360 degree camera, which is not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, it appears as if they've nicked uh, camera lenses off of cheap CCTV cameras. Um, and uh, it's stitched together in the screen and the screen is not the highest resolution anymore. Um, this used to be, admittedly, uh, Mazda's uh, infotainment system used to be one of the absolute best in the business, but unfortunately, time has not been kind to this thing. And uh, it's gotten a little outdated, admittedly. over 210,000 ringgit doesn't come with a digital instrument cluster is uh, a little bit old hat. I like analog dials as much as the next guy, but in terms of value, this car doesn't quite have it anymore. Also, as part of that active safety gamut, this car doesn't come with adaptive cruise control, which is not exactly new technology at this point. Uh, lane keep assist and lane centering, that's a lot newer in terms of how long the technology has actually been around and implemented in cars. So the fact that this car doesn't come with adaptive cruise control while vehicles like the Toyota Camry and the Honda Accord and the Hyundai Sonata all come with adaptive cruise, this car not offering it is a little bit of a disappointment. And it's disappointing because the lane keep assist in this car is quite aggressive but it is actually very accurate. So when I'm driving on the motorway, like I did a, a long distance run in this car, and uh, I happily kept uh, the lane keep assist on because on the motorway, it takes away some of the strain. But the fact that I have to keep accelerating and braking like a Luddite in an older car, sort of removed a little bit of the sheen. If it had adaptive cruise control, it would have been miles better in my opinion. But glossing over that very quickly, that's the blind spot monitoring, glossing over that very quickly, we have to talk about this car's strengths. And uh, of that, there are two main areas, which is ride and handling and refinement. So in terms of ride and handling, it's no secret that Mazda has been renowned for many, many years for its drivability. And to be honest, sitting in this with its big naturally aspirated engine and six-speed automatic gearbox, I have to say it feels like an old BMW. Um, a very, very good friend of mine drives an E39 BMW and he lets me drive it from time to time. And to be honest, driving this, it reminds me of an E39. It's so 
beautifully balanced this thing. The only caveat is that because it's front wheel drive, you don't get that sensation of the car pushing you out of the corner instead you're being pulled out. Um, aside from that though, it's very similar. You have this thin rib steering wheel, it's very communicative, and it's perfectly balanced. Even though this car runs on 19 inch alloy wheels, it doesn't impact the ride at all. This car is perfectly compliant, it's perfectly pleasant. Um, it is communicative. If you are jumping into this from a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry, you may be surprised to find that this car doesn't feel floaty like those two do. It's very communicative, but it's never uncomfortable. I really need to stress that. It is never uncomfortable, this thing. And despite the big wheels, you don't get a lot in the way of uh, tire noise either. So that brings me on to refinement. Even at speed, <coughs> well past the national speed limit, I'm told uh, this car remains quite quiet. The tyres on this thing, I can't remember, these are Bridgestone Terranzas if I'm not mistaken. They are surprisingly quiet, even at high speed, despite the large diameter, and uh, they provide adequate grip. You can very easily get carried away in this car. It is the perfect blend of passenger comfort and driver enjoyment, in my opinion, where its competitors tend to lean too much one way or another. This one is firmly in the middle. And it really shows just how competent and mature Mazda's engineers are. Uh, away from rolling refinement, of course, you have to talk about wind noise. In this car, impressively, it's not that bad. You can drive happily over long distances, like I have, and not be annoyed at this thing. And of course, when the sound does creep in, if you drive like an absolute lunatic, you can just turn up the stereo on the beautiful Bose audio system, which is very punchy, but... Um, Perhaps not the highest fidelity audio system out there. But you know, it's still a name brand audio system, can't complain that much. So, ultimately, the question with this car is, does it have enough to hold its own in the D segment saloon market? And can it actually hold a candle against proper premium cars? For the first question, I think it certainly does. Compared to its compatriots, this is definitely the driver's choice. And in doing so, you're not compromising or sacrificing on passenger comfort at all. On top of that, it also looks great. So when you bring it home, no one's going to think that you've arrived in oversized Civic or Corolla. Um, on the other hand, does it have what it takes to hold its own against premium cars? Well, uh, at over 200 grand, you have to compare it against vehicles like the C-Class, the Mercedes-Benz C-Class and the BMW 3 Series, among others. And uh, if you're looking for brand prestige, there is just no replacement for the brand. This is a Mazda. It's a very pretty Mazda, I admit, and another pretty Mazda is about to go past. But it's just, it's just not a premium car, and you can't run away from that. On the other hand, if you are willing to be pragmatic about it, I think that this is slightly more refined than some of those cars. It's even more comfortable than some of those cars. And on top of that, you get a hell of a lot more space than those cars, um, both for passengers and for things. And if I'm honest, it just it presents itself really well. On top of that, Burma's, uh, Mazda's official distributor in Malaysia, has done an excellent job in providing great after-sales service in a wide network of, uh, of uh, service centers and repair centers across the country, which means that you can actually own one of these with a great amount of ease. And uh, of course, instead of having a turbocharged engine, which tends to cost a little bit more to maintain and sometimes can be slightly less reliable, you have a big naturally aspirated engine which doesn't consume that much in fuel and it feels wonderful it's so responsive and so peppy i absolutely love it so if you're on the market for a premium car consider the mazda 6 before you plonk down that massive down payment for a bmw 3 series or a mercedes-benz c-class but if you're on the market for a d-segment saloon you absolutely do not want to miss this one you really don't you will be missing out a lot Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell icon so that you're notified every time we make a new upload. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media channels, which are all linked in the description below. And uh, of course, if you enjoyed this and you want to see more content like this, leave us a comment down below and let us know what you'd like to see next in our videos. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys are staying safe and staying healthy. We'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.